Hello, I'm Audrey Tang, Taiwan's Digital Minister in charge of social innovation. Taiwan's uh, Digital Minister, I'm really happy to be here uh, and honored uh, to be part of the Radical Exchange community, also as a board member of the Radical Exchange Foundation. Uh, please uh, make this a interactive conversation. I see already there's uh, the two questions on Slido. First one from Christina uh, for thanking the organizers for recognizing Juneteenth. And then from Matt asking, are any of the sessions being recorded? Um, so I believe that all the sessions, uh, at least mine, <laughs> is recorded. Uh, but uh, I, about the usage and things like that, I'm not quite sure what the production team have in mind. Maybe uh, they can uh, answer you on Slido. So um, I will now say that um, we will uh, make sure that the moderator is here looking at all the Slido questions and the moderator just answered that the recording will be made available right after the conference. So as you can see, please vote on each other's questions and we will strive to answer them uh, as quickly as possible. Now, uh, in the next 45 minutes, uh, I will share some thoughts around digital social innovation as practiced in Taiwan, because in Taiwan, we believe that democracy is an evolving social technology, having our first presidential election only in 1996, uh, after the wild web, part of the wild web. And digital technology remains since 1996 to this day, one of the best way to improve participation, as long as the focus is on finding common ground and creating common understanding. That is to say pro-social media, not anti-social media. So uh, I will share with you how Taiwan countered the coronavirus, the pandemic with no lockdown and how we countered the infodemic with no takedown. And I think this is uh, a preferable alternative to concentrating power to the state or concentrating power to a few capitalists. And that is what radical exchange is all about to me. Now, um, I will share with you some slides uh, and uh, please feel free to inject any slide of questions uh, during my slide presentation. Uh, so I will just jump to your questions instead of talking through the slides. So um, as you can see uh, in Taiwan, when we talk about social innovation, we mean people who participate from all walks of life in order to publicly benefit the society. It is the cornerstone of Taiwan's collective intelligence response system, and it is really fast. That's one of the three pillars, fast, fair, and fun. So using COVID as an example, whereas many economies began countering coronavirus only this year, Taiwan started last year. Last December, when Dr. Li Wenliang, the PRC whistleblower, posted on the social media in PRC, the People's Republic of China regime, that there are new SARS cases. He got inquiries and eventually punishments for his um, rumor spreading <laughs> from his local police institutions. But at the same time, the Taiwan equivalent of Reddit, which is not-for-profit entity created by National Taiwan University students called the PTT, um, noticed it with somebody with the name No More Pipe reposting it and uh, upvoting the whistleblowing from Dr. Li Wenliang so that our medical officers took notice immediately. Uh, and so on that very day, they issued an order that says all the passengers flying in from Wuhan to Taiwan the very next day, the first day of January, need to start health inspections. So this says to me two things. First, that the civil society trusts the government enough to talk about possible new SARS outbreaks in a public forum and that the government trusts the citizen enough to take it very seriously and treat it as if SARS has happened again, something we've always been preparing since 2003. And according to the Civicus Monitor, Taiwan is the only country in the whole of Asia that has a completely open civil society, and one of the only two along with New Zealand in Asia Pacific. And so we enjoy the same freedom, speech, assembly, the press, and so on, as other liberal democratic countries, but with the emphasis on keeping an open mind to novel ideas from the society based on participatory mechanism design. And this is um, why our schools and business, I guess, uh, remain open with no lockdowns uh, so far. And so um, that is uh, an example here. And there's a slide of question. How often are there false whistleblowers on Taiwan's Reddit? 
um, every single hour, but they don't get upvoted. That's the beauty of collective intelligence. Um, so every day during the pandemic uh, for almost uh, four months, actually, more than four months, every day our Central Epidemic Command Center holds a press conference, which is always live streamed and they answer all the questions from all the journalists and also from the citizens. And so anyone can call this hotline 1922 and tell their idea, their innovation uh, to the CECC. And uh, the CECC, if it is a false whistleblowing, as someone who asked, um, they just investigate and ignore that. But if it's a really good idea, if it's true, then they elevate it into policy action the very next day. So one example, there was one day in April when a young boy uh, who said he doesn't want to go to school because uh, we were rationing masks at the time. And when you ration, you don't get to pick the color and all his mm, district had is pink medical mask so that uh, his schoolmates may laugh at him, according to the boy, for wearing a pink medical mask. And so um, I think his friend called 1922 to say that. The very next day, everybody at the CECC press conference start wearing pink medical mask making sure that everybody learns about gender mainstreaming, which is also a social innovation. So this kind of rapid response cycle builds trust between the government and the civil society. I would argue that is the cornerstone of modern day democracy is to have a short iteration cycle instead of only have like three bits of information every four years, which is called voting. Another focus uh, in the Fast Fair Fund is called fairness. Now, in Taiwan, when we say fairness, we do not mean that the state monopolizes everything. In addition to masks being rationed, there's also a market for masks going on. Uh, these are in parallel. Uh, and just like that, for all government services, uh, for example, the national participation platform joined the GOV.TW. Um, if the people doesn't like it or have some ideas of how to improve it, they can fork the government service very easily Forking, meaning taking what's there, taking it to a different um, direction with the hope that one day they be merged by changing one single letter, the O letter, into a digit and build join.g0v.tw. That is to say, all the government websites have a civil society counterpart, potentially. There's hundreds of those. Uh, just by changing an O to a zero, you get into kind of this shadow government, which offers a future prototype of what a government could be. And because they always relinquish most of the copyright using open source and creative common licenses, the government can merge it back into the government service anytime. This is what I call reverse procurement. So one example, when we ramped up the facial mask production, uh, people were panicking for a few days because uh, they found out that the uh, convenience stores, the pharmacies, all run out of masks in the very early days. However, uh, when that happened, a civic uh, technologist with the name Howard Wu in Tainan just built uh, a map where his friends and families can voluntarily report uh, which stores still have medical masks available uh, and color it on the map. Although he only managed to keep that service running for two days before millions of people overwhelm his uh, server, uh, one of those millions of people is me, and I show it to the premier, uh, who thinks it's a really good idea and we need to support it uh, with um, any cost. And so our national health insurance system, which is a single payer system that covers 99.99% uh, of all people, not just citizens, but also residents, uh, work with the pharmacies so that the, all the pharmacies agree to publish in a um, short cycle, I think it was 30 seconds at that time, um, how many adult masks there are uh, in their stock, 58 in this uh, instance, and how many children's masks, in this case, 196. And so this is on the uh, Wang An uh, County in the Penghu, the Pescador Islands. And so uh, when this information is published every 30 seconds, this created a distributed ledger where everybody can have a copy and check for themselves. You can take your national health insurance card to that pharmacy and get nine medical masks per two weeks if you're an adult, 10 if you're a child, and actually see this number decrease after just um, a couple of minutes uh, to, I think, uh, to 49. And if this number doesn't change after two minutes or three, you will call 1922 and say something is wrong. And so this is very important because this is truly distributed for people with blindness who cannot see the map. 
there is chatbot available on the very first day. Now there's more than 140 tools uh, through voice assistants and maps, apps, chatbots, and so on. Uh, the same open data that is shared through an API by the National Health Insurance System makes sure that everybody feel calm and collected because they can see uh, participatorily what is really happening with our mass production. So we, when we ran by the production and the rationing became like three per week to uh, nine per two weeks and so on, uh, the independently made dashboard showed everybody how it has grown. And also that this also enables independent analysis. Uh, civic technologies built a dashboard that lets people see uh, that for some places there's a oversupply, for some places there's a undersupply and things like that. And that is really interesting because then it's evidence-based policy making, but the legitimacy comes from the social sector, that is to say the civic sector, not the public sector. So on Slido, there's two questions now that's very relevant. Uh, the top question now is that, do you think this replicable to larger countries? Yes, uh, because this open source and open API, people in South Korea just took this and convinced their government to start offering API for the PPE uh, stock level. They used to use a Freedom of Information Act model where people look at the number before publishing it. And using that model, you can maybe get a public information a tally every week or every day if you're really committed. But this is every 30 seconds. Uh, that is to say machine to machine distributed ledgers. And they managed to convince the South Korean uh, government people saying Taiwan has seen such a success doing that. Why don't we do so? So they did that four weeks afterward. And their first working map is from Tainan, uh, even though the author, uh, Fin Jian Kiang, did not speak uh, Korean. Uh, both of them speak JavaScript. So they can very easily just change their API uh, and to repurpose it for PPE uh, visualization. Another question is that, um, what are the biggest challenge with this system and did anything go wrong? Excellent question. Yes, quite a few things. Um, in the very beginning, uh, we see a lot of pharmacists uh, um, resisted the system because they were handing out uh, numbered cards um, so that the people do not need to swipe their NHI card. But that created a imbalance because you already uh, have those numbered cards full before they swipe the NHI card, creating a situation uh, where the stock level is still high, but actually it's all already pre-booked. And we solve this by co-creating with the pharmacist so that they can manually uh, and eventually automatically, eventually through a vending machine, uh, input their uh, pre-allocated um, badges and also just hit a key to say that uh, we are out of stock today. And people can still audit it by reporting when they're standing in a queue if the pharmacist closes off too soon. So we managed to gain more trust by co-creating with the pharmacist. Another thing that went wrong uh, was that people complained um, that they could not get a mask because they work very long hours. When they go off work, all the pharmacies are out of um, the, their working hours anyway. And indeed, this dashboard showed exactly that. People uh, working in uh, like um, the Science Park in Xinzhu, uh, in large financial centers in Taipei, they are the people who cannot get uh, the ration mask, even though their nearby pharmacies have plenty of stock. And because of independent analysis shows that, um, we must then uh, work on the way to collect the mask uh, 24 hours. So you can see our premier, um, Su Zhenchang, smiling very happily here because after a month or so, we started working with the convenience stores so that anyone with their national health insurance card can go to a kiosk um, and pre-order the mask and collect that a week afterward. So there is no queuing because it's a pre-order system. Uh, and that's when uh, the availability rate came from 70% at that time after we introduced the convenience store uh, to over 90% of population. That is to say 21 million people out of 23 million people in Taiwan. And for the remaining 2 million, maybe they still um, did not want to get a mask because they have plenty uh, already prepared before the pandemic. We even develop an extra system that allow them to dedicate their uncollected quota for international humanitarian aid to the doctors and nurses overseas. And so far, we have dedicated more than 5 million of such 
uh, medical masks uh, from people's uncollected quota, uh, and uh, half of them, about 300,000 people, choose to reveal their name publicly, the other half uh, anonymously. So this is not unlike many RxC ideas. This is almost like a prototype of a data collision, a data collaborative. So, uh, and before we move on to the fun part, um, there is also a, another question saying, uh, do you think that this uh, collaboration was contributed only because the spirit of overcoming the crisis? Are there non-crisis situations where it could help? I would say that this prototype was so quickly put together because Taiwan is already used to the idea of a plurality-based data collaborative. Our flagship uh, program, the civil IoT platform, uh, makes sure that everybody with data to join can upload their data into a distributed ledger and host it, um, co-host it by the National Center of High-Speed Computing, which is top 20 um, supercomputer in the world with a lot of very uh, inexpensive GPU computing power available to everybody. So even if you're a high school student, you will be able to type in some code and uh, churn through all the environmental data as measured by the air boxes in Taiwan, each of them less than 100 euros, uh, and reports the PM2.5 value and other air pollution values uh, everywhere in Taiwan into a distributed ledger, so you cannot go back and modify the air pollution measurement values in time. And this together creates a network with 10 times more measurement stations than the state has. So the state has far less legitimacy than the social sector. So the social sector negotiated with the state saying, first, you need to provide us with this high-speed computing for free. And second, we want to ask you to go to those red points where are the industrial parks, private property, that those social sector people, most of them primary school teachers teaching data stewardship, uh, cannot break and enter and install air pollution measurement devices. And so it turns out the labs are owned by the municipal government. So many mayors agreed to put their micro uh, sensor into the lamp in the industrial parks, altogether creating a much more accurate picture and also for sustainable education and global citizenship because it's open innovation. Everybody can download it and run it off a local Raspberry Pi or Arduino instance because we already have this tradition uh, of civic um, sector taking over essentially agenda setting on environmental sensing and things like that. This makes sure that when the mask rationing happens, everybody has plenty of tools already made. They just need to adjust the API source to visualize the mask, uh, things like that. Um, so um, I will move on to the fun part uh, before answering the uh, slide of questions. So um, in the Taiwan uh, situation, we see that um, because we never had a uh, community spread of the COVID, we have a far larger problem, which is now called infodemic in many parts of the world. That is to say, because people are really very stressful, including in Taiwan, people are really stressful uh, and people feel anxious. And when people feel anxious uh, and they see any message that provokes um, outrage, they will click share. So any message in that environment, if uh, on average, one person shared to three other people uh, having an R0 value of three, then outrage will go viral. And that will lead to panic buying, conspiracy theories, divisiveness, things like that. And in Taiwan, because we cannot use administrative takedown because we're a uh, liberal democracy, uh, we use uh, something else. We call it humor over rumor. And it really works very well. The underlying idea is that um, if people feel fun about something, it's actually impossible for them to feel outrage at the same time about the same thing. So if we can manage to create a meme, an internet meme that goes more viral than the conspiracy theory, then actually it will vaccinate people. So one example, uh, you see our premier smiling happily two slides before. Now, at that time, there was a panic buying of tissue papers because a rumor said, oh, we're ramping up medical mass production from 2 million to 20 million a day. It's the same material as the tissue paper, so we will run out of tissue paper soon. And a lot of people just went out and buy tissue papers, leading to panic buying. Now, within two hours, the same premier, smiling in the previous slide, now shows his button, wiggling it a little bit. And in a very large print on social media, say, 
each of us only have one pair of photons. And, and this is brilliant because uh, in Mandarin, stockpiling and botok is the same sound, tun is a homonym. And so it's hilarious. And because of that, and also the formatting, as you can see, is the tissue paper box. Uh, the important payload of this meme saying that medical masks are made out of domestic material, while tissue paper are made out of South American material. People remember that and people voluntarily share it. This maybe have an Arnold value of five, reach a lot of people in no time. And so we can literally see that people who saw this funny meme stopped sharing the conspiracy theories around the tissue paper panic buying. And within 48 hours, the uh, panic buying died down. And we found out the person who spread a rumor in the first place was a tissue paper reseller, go figure. And, and this is not just a single shot thing in social media. Every single CECC daily press conference gets translated by the Ministry of Health and Welfare spokes dog or Dong Chai, the doji, the dog CEO um, that translated physical distancing. When you're outdoor, you need to stay two dog away from each other, uh, indoor three dog away from each other and that you need to cover your mouth and nose when sneezing. Do not do what the dog does here. Um, and wear a mask to protect yourself from your own hands touching your face. Uh, so remember to pre-order those masks and so on. Very cute dog memes. And because all of this goes viral, we make sure that our humor, our factual humor spread faster than rumor. And this is how we made sure that Taiwanese people feel calm and collected even during the pandemic. Um, about the humanitarian aid, I saw something on Slido mentioning that. You can find everyone's uh, name uh, who choose to reveal their name in Taiwan can help that us. And there you will also find uh, Vice President Chen Jianren at the time, also our top epidemiologist, literally the person who wrote the epidemiology textbook, who was our vice president at the time. Um, teaching an online MOOC, a massive online course, uh, is also translated to English uh, about the coronavirus. And uh, that is why our top scientific expert doesn't have to convince our top political authority, because all he has to do is to look into the mirror uh, and convince the top political authority when it comes to um, epidemiology. And so that's the slides that I prepare. I think what I would do now is stop sharing my screen and focus now on the slide of questions. So we have quite some questions here, 12 questions all, and we have 20 minutes, please keep them coming. Um, so the top question now, what is the level of digital literacy in Taiwan? What is the share of population with no access to digital tools? Is there any digital exclusion? Um, so in Taiwan, broadband is a human right. Anywhere in Taiwan, even on the peak of Taiwan, almost 4,000 meters high, the Sabiya, the Jade Mountain, everyone is guaranteed to have 10 megabits per second um, bidirectionally at 16 euros per month with no additional cost, uh, it's not metered. And if you don't, it's my fault personally, you can call me. Uh, and I will make sure that when we deploy 5G later in the year, that, uh, that your place gets um, a higher priority. But uh, overall, I think we completed uh, coverage of more than 90, 8% of households when it comes to broadband access. And for people who cannot afford tablets, they can lend them uh, through the digital opportunity centers in the indigenous lands and in the rural places. All in all, that makes sure that um, I think all age groups have an internet use rate over um, 90%, around 97, 98, uh, except for people under 12, that was only 80 something. Uh, and also people who are above, uh, I think, 75 years old. Uh, but I think that is mostly due to health and not uh, due to uh, cap capability. Uh, and we teach not digital literacy, but digital competence in our K-12 uh, education, starting from the first grade. Uh, when you say literacy, you assume that they are consumers of data. When you say competence, you assume they are producers of data, producers of media producers of creative works and competence is what we want from a population because everybody is co-creating the democracy together. The top question now asks, what stops other countries from adopting a similar model of civic hackers officially working with the government? 
there's uh, usually three uh, axes when a career public service considers working with civic technologists. First, does it save time? So all the technology I just introduced save time for career public service because they tell the signal from the noise. And second, whether it increased political risk or not. Again, because the civic technology already demonstrated legitimacy, there's no political risk in accepting what's already a very popular idea into public service, so it reduces risk. And three, whether it improved trust between the government and people. By making the government transparent to the people, the government trusts its people. And whether people trust back is another matter altogether, but the government need to improve its trust level to the people. And so if you do all three, of course, it's a great civic tech story. But even if you only do one of the three, saving time, reducing risk, and improving trust, you can do it without sacrificing the other two, making it a Pareto improvement. And if you consistently do that, you will not run into any obstacles. It's only when you trade one for the other two do you create a tension between the career public service and the civic technologist. So nowadays, our civic technologists participating in the counter-pandemic effort call themselves civil engineers, because when your code gets used regularly by more than 10 million people out of a um, you know, 23 million people country, it's just like highway builders. It's just like builders of bridges and roads uh, because everybody uses your work. And so they see themselves now as civil engineers as opposed to just civic technologists. Um, another question. So um, Anastasia uh, would like to know, can foreigners contribute ideas to the government of Taiwan that they could not implement in uh, countries that they are less keen to innovate. Yes, and you are in luck. Uh, we still have five days to go when it comes to the presidential hackathon. Uh, so you can uh, search for a Taiwan presidential hackathon and get your ideas in. Uh, even though if you are not in our travel bubble, uh, we will still FedEx um, the, the trophy to you if you win the Sustainable Development Goal um, oriented presidential hackathon. Actually, today is the workshop day of the domestic presidential hackathon. And this is worth going into a little bit because in Taiwan, what we are saying is essentially anyone with a good idea can propose those ideas. This year, more than 250 teams, I think. Uh, and each of them gets voted by quadratic voting, which is a radical exchange idea. Everyone in our joint platform, 10 million of them, um, actually only 10,000 of them actively votes. Uh, but anyway, so uh, they have 99 points each. Now they can see all those different um, SDG targets as uh, identified by the presidential hackathon teams. If they really like, for example, using air box, but changing it to water box, measuring um, water pollutions in the agric lands so that the people who pollute the agric waterways gets punished by cutting off their electricity and water, that's a law. And people who are not po uh, polluting the waterways also install the water box into a distributed ledger, solar powered now, because uh, they want to prove the pollution come from upstream. Now that's incentive design. Um, if you really like the idea, you can vote at most nine votes, which will cost you 81 points. But you have 99 points, so you still have 18 points left, but you cannot vote the 10th vote because that will then cost you 100 points and you don't have 100 points. So you'll be prompted to look into some other idea, for example, using uh, computer vision to detect marine debris before they hit the shores. You now that sounds pretty good. And you have 18, so you vote four votes, which cost you 16. And then you have to find two other interesting ideas and learn about some more global goals. And maybe you see synergy and you, you do a seven and seven. So this is almost magical. If you use quadratic voting, everybody feel they have won when we announced the top 24 this year because they voted for at least one of those projects, likely. If you use one person, one vote, almost everybody will feel that they have lost because there's just so many ideas. And so quadratic voting by itself improved the legitimacy of the presidential hackathon. And we coached those teams for two months, uh, including its original prototype, so there's three months. And the five winning teams get a trophy from our president. Uh, it looks like an island of Taiwan uh, with a micro projector underneath. 
there's no prize money, uh, but if you turn on the projector, it shows you Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, who was just here uh, today, uh, who listened to all the 24 pitches. Uh, and the projector will show Tsai Ing-wen handing you the trophy, promising you whatever you did in the past three months of co-creation will become public policy in the next 12 months. So that's presidential executive power as a hackathon prize. So if you're interested in that trophy, you still have five days to attend the Taiwan International track of the presidential hackathon. Um, the next question is, how do you think that we, uh, who aspire for data plurality, can combat possible security threat concerns for some uh, governments about open data policies? So I would say that cybersecurity is a real concern and many governments refuse to take in data coming in from uh, civic sources precisely because they were afraid of black hats. Now, so you have two options. First, you can work with white hat hackers who prove um, sometime in a very lively way uh, that penetration testing, threat hunting, and things like that, partnering with white hats really is the only way uh, to improve the security as opposed to security theater. But maybe you do not have a good connection with the white hat hacker community, but uh, the hope is not lost. You can focus on working with data that has no personally identifiable information. The reason why GovZero first chose Airboxes as the uh, platform is not a coincidence because Air would not object of being measured. They then work on water boxes and then work on maybe earthquake and landslide prevention and just very gradually started now working on personal health management and still in airplane mode only, not even transmitting to anywhere, not even Bluetooth. And they bill it as something that when a contact tracer come and find you, well, you will just say, oh, here is a one click link that shared the absolute minimum needed by contact tracing without divulging privacy information about your friends and family as you would during a traditional interview. So completely privacy preserving. And so when you collect no personal data, there is no risk of leaking personal data. And that's one of the ways that uh, if you're working for data plurality can work on the least sensitive, least personally identified information and slowly work your way toward all the while keeping on personal data in a privacy enhancing technology. It could be ZK, it could be full homomorphic encryption, it could be federated learning, it doesn't matter. What matters is that the people who use your code understand it's in their best interest, not somebody else's. So another question from Peter. Uh, people would like to know, how do you catch social media rumors fast enough to combat them with humor? Uh, well, very easily by people flagging it, just like how spam house detects spam. Uh, it's people voluntarily donating a piece of their inbox to the global, um, you know, uh, blocking list and the spam house network. And so um, the leading antivirus company in Taiwan, Trend Micro, uh, has this doctor message tool, which is also a cute dog. There's something about cute dogs uh, in Taiwan, uh, where if you see a piece of uh, rumor, uh, or scam or really whatever, you can forward it to that bot. So even in end-to-end -end encrypted channels, that bot can also scan just like an antivirus, each incoming message and compare it with the database of reports. And uh, professional fact checkers and journalists would then see what gets trending uh, fast enough. And there's many, if you don't like the economic sector building such a tool, there's also a social sector equivalent called COFAX that lets people flag such rumors. Um, the next question asks, how can this work in the country, I think in the US, with such systemic inequality and history of racial injustice, can it really fix those things? Well, I remember in Taiwan, the martial law. I, I remember people, you know, getting disappeared, um, tortured, even the white terror. Um, and my parents were both journalists, and they have to constantly censor themselves before lifting of the martial law. That was around the end of 80s. Uh, so it's not a distant memory in Taiwan uh, that we were not a democracy when I was young. Um, and so we cherish the democracy that we gained. Uh, and when we occupy the parliament, we make sure that our demonstration in 2014 is not a protest to take down democracy, 
but rather a demonstration in the sense of a demo to show how people, the demos, um, half a million on the street, many more online, can manage to come to rough consensus and running code uh, when it comes to deliberating real policy. And after that demonstration, everything changed because people now see that with the pro-social tools, professional facilitators, and multi-stakeholderism, people can actually get something working and get to four demand, not one less, and actually get ahead of parliament to accept that. So if you look for sunflower uh, movement, you will see the fine details. But if you ask a random person on the street before sunflower whether that's possible, they will also tell you that's impossible. And that's just what, six years ago. Next question. Uh, will would like to know, has Taiwan always had the spirit of political innovation or is there just a new development? How long would this transition take elsewhere? Well, just like in many uh, new democracies, there's less legacy code running, so to speak, uh, and there's more people willing to make contributions to democracy just simply because uh, they grow up with the internet and internet with its multi-stakeholderism model for all its flaws is really a different way of running politics. And because of that, I think everywhere in the world, if you start with a polity that's small enough, maybe a township or things like that, you can deploy such technologies really quickly. And that's partly why radical exchange work on the local governance levels uh, for most of the time, because with a, a smaller polity, people feel that there's more chance of getting meaningful change in. So Taiwan always had the spirit of political innovation, but when it turns truly digital, I think the great accelerator is still the 2014 Occupy and of course the 2019 pandemic. Um, the next question, Colin, um, have security vulnerabilities in government APIs problems in the past? How does Taiwan mitigate those risks? Good question. Uh, two things. First of all, we allocate five to 7% of all our IT budget into cybersecurity. So if you are a white hat hacker, you get paid really well. You have a shining career path. There's penetration, threat hunting, perfect teaming, chances everywhere. You meet with the minister and the president all the time. You get treated like national heroes, uh, all, all to prove that white hat hackers um, are really national heroes. And so they don't fall to the dark side, which has more cookies. Uh, and so that's our partnership strategy. And we're looking in the next four years to increase the budget of cybersecurity to five to percent of not IT budget, but total budget for each new government and that's a lot of money. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is that we make sure that we do not use internet uh, for, for example, the kiosk that I just showed you in convenience store where you can use your NHI card to procure the mask. We make sure that it's not connected to the public internet. It's that simple. So next question, um, how do you maximize access and usage of those civic tools and prevent them from becoming forgotten or unused? Well, it's very simple actually. The trick is that you bring technology to the people instead of asking people to come to technology. For example, uh, I will now show you uh, my office, literally my office. This is the social innovation lab in the heart of Taipei. It's a park. Everybody can walk in with their dog uh, and talk to me uh, for 40 minutes at a time uh, every Wednesday. Uh, and there's no walls, literally no walls. Uh, and everybody can see very transparently as I work. And this is intentional because of the 12 ministries who have uh, secondments here, uh, all work in a working out loud, literally quite loud and transparent fashion. Uh, the people would see those people designing participatory mechanisms as willing to participate and contribute their unique viewpoint. For example, the soccer field here are created by people uh, with Down syndrome, with trisomy differences. So because of that, we see them not as vulnerable groups to be protected, but rather inspiring artists who can contribute to the creativity uh, and the flow of the space. And also every other Wednesday or so, I tour around Taiwan to the places that are farther from Taipei and join them in indigenous uh, places in the remote islands where the local social entrepreneurs, co-ops, MPO people, and so on, just have a regular town hall. I moderate that, but I usually stay for a night before or two nights before to have the ethnographic understanding, really just hanging out with the local culture. And because we have more than 20 national languages, sometimes with indigenous cultural translators. 
But when we have that town hall, we connect because Brabant is a human right, remember? To the social innovation lab where the 12 ministries, section chiefs or higher look at the local people, empowering the people closest to the pain to tell their entire story and brainstorm possible solution right there. It reduces risk because if people get angry, I'm the only one in the vicinity, uh, and it improves trust because people can see those civil service really solving their problem instead of causing more problem by abstract policy making. And also it saves everybody's time because they don't have to travel to remote islands uh, with me. Uh, and so that satisfies the Pareto improvement criteria and that ensures that people become aware of those social innovation tools and use them regularly. The next question asks, um, this is amazing. Uh, do you think we could apply this to every resource type, food, water, shelter everywhere in the world? Well, certainly uh, you can apply it. The trick is that the scale of which that you can apply it. You can scale it up, trying to allocate more resources than the 20 million medical masks a day. Uh, by the way, if your country wants uh, this kind of automated plant, 24 hours producing 2 million a day, uh, you can just call the Taiwan champion mask who are now busily setting up uh, such plants everywhere. Uh, and if you want to uh, allocate them, we have open source code, you know where to find on GitHub. So of course you can try to scale it up beyond the scale we already do in 23 million people. Uh, however, uh, you can also scale it out, making sure that people join in a loose federation and uh, just like the regular exchange chapters and do some sort of collective decision making together. Or you can scale it deeply, uh, working with the public servants so that they see this is actually a better way of making policies in this century. Max would like to know, what are your favorite resources to stay updated to date with the Taiwan civic technology scene, even if uh, it's written in traditional Chinese? Well, still the best website is join.g0v.tw. Uh, even though the national participation platform join GOVTW have more than 10 million visitors, um, join g0v.tw is where it happens. And I think there's uh, regular tweets, their regular posts, uh, there's a Slack channel and things like that. And also it's quite connected to Radical Exchange Chapter Taipei. Of course, you're also welcome to follow their tweet account. So the next question, uh, Christina uh, would like to know, it looks like the Taiwanese people trust the government more than in other countries. That's because our government trusts the people more than in other countries. Uh, and um, how, how do you improve that in other countries? Again, the government needs to trust the citizens more. And there's always an outside game in Taiwan. Implicitly, if we do not make sure that uh, the pharmacies and the convenience stores uh, work together, um, there's always this outside game of people just reporting it, right? There's this Ushahidi-like uh, crowdsourcing reporting system is already there. So um, just like if we do not make this scalable listening technology available, uh, there's always the risk of people going into the parliament occupying it again. Having an outside game at all times, that is really the most important thing. So um, the two people would like to know how often are resources allocated democratically and by need, in addition to participation being very democratic. Um, well, I think democracy uh, and by need uh, is actually not uh, in tension to one another. As I said, we both have a rationed uh, nationalized economy of mask, but also in addition to the basic rationing, we also have a free market going on here. So in Taiwan, it's never either or, it's always both. And once you have both, the people's feedback will let you know, the market will let you know uh, wh where do you draw this uh, slider. And I think we have time for maybe last question. Um, the last question is, have any privacy concerns been raised about the use of technology in Taiwan? Oh, of course, uh, in Taiwan, of course, has a European style uh, personal data protection law, which is why we invest so much uh, in personal uh, data uh, protection and privacy enhancing technologies. And our, for example, we never had a Bluetooth uh, based contact tracing app. And precisely because people only trust code that they have written themselves uh, and only when it's open source and things like that. So just as we are forced to innovate, uh, to use humor, to counter humor, 
without working on the takedowns because it's just not possible. Uh, and we have to work with our top down, lockdown, or any state imposed um, app level um, data collection. Basically, we do not collect new data during the pandemic because constitutionally we're barred from doing that except in a state of emergency and because we never declare a state of emergency everything we do need to be democratic and pre-approved by the parliament and because of that we tend to reuse data that's already collected for statistical aggregation uh, or other purposes but we do not as a rule uh, have to stay collect new data when a new situation comes now, um, I know that I only have one minute left. Uh, so sorry for the other 20 questions that I do not have time to answer, but I will uh, end this talk uh, with a display of my work, <laughs> uh, which is uh, in the 17th global goals, the 17th goal, uh, in particular, reliable data, effective partnerships and open innovation, which I believe is also the core of the radical exchange movement. And I wish all of you working on those numbers, uh, working on all of those global goals, you know, specifically in the 17th school, to make unlikely partnerships out of different positions. And I will read my job description, which is these goals translated into plain English to end this talk. So this is my job description. When we see the internet of things, let's make it a internet of beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it shared reality. And when we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear the singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. Thank you for listening. Live long, prosper, have a good local time.